the Blackwoods. Henrietta was the youngest daughter of the Lovitz, born the seventh child on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year. She was the only daughter to survive past her teen years. Her older sisters succumbed to many methods of death. One was beaten by her drunken husband, one had died from hypothermia in a row house, one had died from a factory accident. Henrietta survived despite all odds, a curse seemed to linger on the Lovett women. She was born with an intelligent mind, a love of animals and nature, and she was lovely. Whether she was beautiful was completely decided by the eyes of others. Henrietta cared about her health, caring for her physical appearance, as one should. Beauty was completely irrelevant to who she was, despite her mother's and father's objections. When she was at the tender age of twenty, she fell into the horrible dread of her mortality. She wondered about her life and if anything was truly worth the idea of life. The first mercy granted to her was by a man named Rupert Blackwood, the father to the man she would be married to. Rupert dressed finely in his plaid vest and matching suit, took the hand of Henrietta as she stepped into the carriage. She was dressed as warmly as possible by her mother and wished well. She would never return to her family and would be married to a man she had never met. Henrietta tried to think of what compelled her to go. Not the marriage, not the idea of life better than she could be provided. Not her depression leads her to simply take life one day at a time. There was something else in her mind, but she did not know what it was. It would not take long for her to find out. Henrietta watched the outside of the window, hands folded together, clutching a handkerchief. Rupert, who sat across from her in their carriage, remained quiet. He figured it would be highly inappropriate to break her thoughts. It was she who broke the silence. Mr. Blackwood? Her voice was soothing like a melody, steady despite her nerves. Perhaps we should engage in conversation. Even a little will be sufficient. Ms. Lovett, I apologize. I did not wish to disturb you. How could my father-in-law disturb me? He smiled politely. He was so even in every expression. You are very kind. Would you like to know the appearance of your husband? I do not care about his appearance, she chose to say. Tell me about who he is as a gentleman. His eyes watched her for a second. Well, I suppose he is a gentleman. Considerate of his appearance and his civility in the public eyes. When he speaks, he speaks with such care and gentleness. Though he is quiet, he is deeply reflective. Does he enjoy animals? He is rather fond of cats and greyhounds. He has always loved greyhounds. He now owns one by the name of Biscuit. She could not help herself and burst into a giggle. The woman covered her mouth, clearing her throat. And there are a couple of cats now occupying his home. Edgar and Bast. Bast was a rather interesting choice. But he adores them all. Does he smoke cigarettes? No. Does he partake of alcohol regularly? Only during social gatherings, holidays, and such. Is he well read? Yes, quite well. There is a library in his home. He noticed how she lit up at the thought of it. He was instructed by private tutors and is very talented as a pianist. H.M., he seems quite wonderful. She offered, looking at her lap. She looked out again. Will he be kind? He seemed completely surprised by her question, replying honestly in the affirmative. Thank you. That is all I could ever want. It was a divine manner, exquisite in every sense of the word. It seemed almost like a castle. Turreted towers, endless windows, it could only be empty with all of its space. It was stretching into the lawn, which was flourishing with roses of all kinds. She gasped at the sight, seeing the magnitude, feeling the odd desire to run through the halls of it. Rupert extended his arm to guide her inside. She obediently slipped her hand around his arm, and they walked together. 
The doors opened, and she felt the first wave of warmth she had never felt before. It was not dreary but decorated with such a heavy palette of colors. Everything around her in the front hall was deep to her eyes. She blinked for several minutes and looked at Rupert. I find a woman could create something more homely. Perhaps, she offered. Your husband is somewhere around here, but I will find him for you. Will I need my mother-in-law? In due time, Rupert told her. Please excuse me. He disappeared, climbing the stairs. She watched him go, staying in her spot. She listened around herself, crossing to look out the windows. She crossed again, finding a painting of a woman in a wedding dress, sitting while her husband stood directly behind her. Henrietta studied it for a moment, catching a sharp voice behind her. Ms. Lovett. The matriarch of the family stood behind her, stern in every sense. She stood with her shoulders back, eyes direct, wearing a plain purple dress. She seemed, not able to be touched, a creature beyond the mortal plane of existence. Mrs. Blackwood. None other, she said. The woman took a step forward, getting closer to a better look at the younger woman. She said nothing, picked up her skirts, and walked away. Her footsteps echoed in the corridor, showing the home's vastness. Henrietta watched feeling a little bit of hot rage seize in her chest. Why on earth would she do such a thing? Rupert gave a little call, returning with his collected son. Here you are, my dear. I hope he is to your liking. The young man stood at his full height, looking like a giant in comparison to his wife. His hair was blonde and messy, eyes a bright evergreen. He seemed unbearably shy in his every movement. This is Merritt Blackwood. We call him Mary. The father presented him, standing beside them as they greeted the other. Henrietta managed to form a hello, feeling her embarrassment flood her senses. In her mind she had imagined him older than her. A refined older man, looking similar to his father with their matching gray hair and lined faces. But he was young, handsome, and so bright. Mr. Blackwood is very nice to meet you. Her face became a little pink trying to maintain her dignity. Merritt, now joining her in a similar demeanor offered with kindness. Ms. Lovett, I am quite honored you are here. He gave a little bow, hands not leaving from behind him. Rupert bit his lip to back his delight at the sight of these two awkward young people. Mary, why don't you show Ms. Lovett around? The modification did not leave as they walked through the corridors. The staff watched them bursting into giggling as they walked past. Henrietta tried to focus on the rooms around her, but it was all for naught. Are you often so quiet when you are beside a woman, Mr. Blackwood? Only around handsome women, Ms. Lovett. He replied, shocking himself with his gall. Ah, yes, thank you. I apologize. No, Mr. Blackwood. I am not annoyed by your compliment she reassured him. In hopes to not stir her courage any further, I find you quite handsome. He was thrown through a loop, stumbling on his own two feet, hastily recovering. May I call you Henrietta? He nearly exclaimed, his courage was climbing ever so slowly. Yes. May I call you Mary? Yes, of course. May I show you your wing? May I see the library instead? Do you enjoy literature, Henrietta? He loved the way her name rolled off his tongue. I adore it. You may consider it yours. Take from it whenever you want. He ushered her there, showing her the room as it encompassed a room of its own. She wished she had eyes all around her so she could see more of it. The room was giant windows on every side so the natural light could illuminate it. Books were all to the ceiling. It was a world of knowledge she had longed for her entire life. The woman's eyes felt teary from her happiness. It was the first time Mary had smiled at her directly. Henrietta spent the rest of the day in the library, 
beginning first with the novel Pride and Prejudice. She drank down the beauty of Jane Austen's words, finishing by dinner time. She was ushered by a maid named Dorothy to the dining room. She whispered a quick, good luck, and escaped to gossip with her peers. Henrietta saw the family already there, Mrs. Blackwood at the head of the table. Her husband beside her, the son across from him. Henrietta took a step into the lion's den. The table sat down, beginning dinner with a silent note. Mary looked at her, smiling with such intimacy. He leaned over whispering to her, You are captivating. The woman blushed again, looking at the table, thanking him as that was all she could muster. The matriarch's eyes focused on the woman, starting the discussion between them. Ms. Lovett? Mrs. Blackwood? Do you find this home acceptable? She mulled on the thought, trying to determine what she was meant to say. It is unlike anything I have ever seen. The men looked between them. Are you the youngest of the family? Do you have sisters in society? No, sadly I am the only daughter in my family now living. My four brothers are all living and in society with families of their own. You are the only daughter alive? Yes. Henrietta managed. There was a pause in the room. The matriarch seemed quite sad by that idea. What do you believe is essential to the family? Essential? I do not understand. What benefits the family in its entirety? What will create the ideal family? I perhaps, the family is a unique concept, considering every individual in it, and what their role is. The mother is the foundation. The father is the leader. The sons and daughters will create and form their own families. It is the parents who will ensure each child will become a functioning member of society, able to be adjusted to social conversation and met with kindness. Would you say your family was met with such an idea? My mother is brilliant, able to adapt despite all hardship, chin held high. My father is hardworking wanting only to ensure his family's livelihood dash. Answer the question, Ms. Lovett. She cleared her throat taking a long sip of her drink before replying. No. I was forced into the role of mothering my brothers, expected to be a daughter of perfection, deprived of my education to meet the needs of others. And look at where you are now. The woman set down her silverware very sharply. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Blackwood. You should be honored to be here. The only daughter left, you must provide a son to create a far better family. What woman would you be? I would be a woman of my own accord. As I'm sure you are, and as I am. You speak so freely for someone so young of an age. She answered. How could you be raised to be so brash? Were your sisters the very same dash? Henrietta stood up, hands grasping her dress skirts, voice shaky from her anger. Mrs. Blackwood. She resisted her tears the best she could. How dare you say such a thing? Rupert's eyes were so wide they showed all of their white exteriors. Mary leaned back in his seat, flicking back and forth between them like a tennis match. The nature of my upbringing was indeed flawed, but that is not your concern. Nor will I sit here and listen to it freely. What woman are you to dismiss the experiences of another? The, the audacity of you, Mrs. Blackwood, her hands shook, her bottom lip began to quiver from her choked back tears now rolling down her face. There was a heavy silence at the table. Rupert turned to look at his wife, who had said nothing. Mary's smirk was wide. Mrs. Blackwood burst into a laugh, pleased. Merit! Yes, mother. You will have this woman's hand in marriage by the end of the week, or I will consider it the highest of disrespect to me. Yes, I will do my best. He agreed, removing his handkerchief from inside his pocket to give to Henrietta. She did not understand for a moment, seeing how her mother-in-law's expression had changed into something of joy. She took the cloth and wiped her face, sitting back down. 
What is this? Think of it as an induction into the family. Why on earth would I want my son to not marry a woman with passion? One with the ability to be fearless? Her similarities to Mary were striking when she grinned. Completely unnecessary, I say. I, I do not believe if I were not one of passion that would make me any less worthy of your son's attention. She laughed again. Yes, I know. But I believe every woman is capable of such passion. She merely shows in different ways. I like the ones that aren't afraid to be outraged. A mad woman is my favorite kind. If she isn't mad about something then she isn't paying attention. Now, what are you angry about? Women cannot vote. Good. What else? Animals are beaten, left to die in the streets, and cruelty is often. Yes, yes, keep going. They continued to speak. Mary watched them go with only excitement. The next day she met Edgar and Bast, laying in the sun in the library both inky black. She bent down to pet them, receiving their attention. Mary returned with Biscuit, a long handsome animal with a prominent pointed nose. She kissed the animal who whined with the thrill of her affection. They took the boy outside and watched him run about the lawn. Henrietta? Yes, Mary? If you like animals, would you like more of them? Yes, many of them. They spoke nearly all day, finding the other had much more in common than they realized. Both were lovers of the arts, wanted to assert themselves further into politics, and they found the other braced the realization they were doomed to die one day. I think of it quite a bit. Mary murmured, fearing she would reject him. Do you ever imagine you are dead? Or why you cannot see your future? She asked him. He looked at her relief flooding his every shaken nerve. Someone understood. When my sister Eliza died, everything fell into me. Women are not as protected and it encompasses every woman. What, what is the point of the existing sometimes? I do not properly understand, Mary offered softly. But I want to. He extended his hand, waiting for her to take it. She took it and decided she would never let it go. Henrietta awoke in the middle of the night, feeling her stomach churn. She threw back her covers as her skin prickled. Her feet touched the cool floor, debating to leave the room. She heard a soft murmur outside of the door which propelled her. The door creaked open and the smell of something vile hit her. It was the smell of unwashed humans. She entered the corridor looking around to detect the sense location. Hen, murmured a voice beside her ear. Hen! She twisted around and saw the faded silhouette of Eliza. Her skin was shredded starting at her legs, her dress was stained from the blood. Hen! She looked over and saw Emma, skin black and body naked. Henny! Then came Jane, beaten. Her neck had the marks of large hands around them. Henrietta felt her terror rake through her, trying to breathe, trying to resist everything around her. She could not move, she could not scream. She begged for someone, anyone to come and find her and save her. They echoed her name, entering her mind, all of them got closer and closer. She collapsed into the floor, bursting into tears. I cannot help you! Please, what do you want? She wept. Henrietta melted into her hands, burying in her knees, begging it all to stop. What are you crying for? Aren't you happy to see us? Asked Jane, bending over. Henrietta peeked from her fingers, seeing something much more familiar. Jane with soothing eyes and long hair, wearing her most favorite brown dress. Emma with her freckled skin, strong arms, and legs. And Eliza, delicate and small in her structure. Her smile, though, was giant. She continued to cry. You're all dead. Well, yeah, said Emma. Doesn't mean we ain't real. Don't cry, hen, said Eliza. What is this? She whimpered out. 
What do you reckon? Joined Mrs. Blackwood, scanning the women around her. Henrietta's eyes got wide, tears slowly dissolving. Smile, my dear. Not many of us get the chance to see our sisters again. You can see them? Of course. Can't you? How? A curse is a curse, my dear. I know your pain all too well. The sisters looked at her, seeing Henrietta stopped crying. Blackwood bent down, grazing a tear on her cheek. Is that why you want me to marry your son? God, no! That's your decision, not mine. But I like seeing a kindred spirit. I want to marry him. But will you teach me what this is? Henrietta, I most certainly will. The End twisted Arcadia. Ah, there I was, standing in front of my new house. I had finally found a new house to replace my cramped apartment. That place was terrible. The apartment was a little bigger than my room at my parents' house, and I had the worst roommates. They were so messy, only had pizza that was sometimes charged to my card, the list goes on. They would also hold these parties every night, and they always let people into my room, leaving it trashed and ransacked. Actually, the whole apartment would be a mess. In fact, when I was out one night working a double shift, I came back to find a couple on my bed, eating the food I was going to have for dinner. It was ramen, but even so I was still angry, watching Netflix on my computer. I lost it that night, and the parties stopped. They did have one every now and then, but they made sure to never let anyone into my room, and they clean up after the party. But they probably did it out of fear I might burst again. My landlord also did nothing about it. After graduating from college, I realized I didn't have to live in the apartment anymore, so I packed my stuff and found a new home. When I came to settle everything about the house, the guy selling me the house seemed ecstatic but not your average yay. I sold the house today. He seemed to be trembling when he was talking with me. And when I bent down to tie my shoe, I saw him clenching his fists, and his knuckles seemed to be pale as a sheet. When I asked who had previously lived here, he almost choked. G-H no no no. And nobody has lived here before, he croaked. His voice cracked and sounded high-pitched. I noted that he kept glancing towards the house next to mine. After the award meeting, I officially moved into my home. After loading all of the boxes into the house, I figured before I unpack anything I should say hi to my new neighbors. I exited the house and walked down the sidewalk to their home. When I arrived on their driveway, I heard some noise. I peeked around the house to see a shadow dragging something behind the house. I tried to look closer, but it was too dark. The shadow seemed to have something clenched over what I thought was the face of the thing it was dragging. It seemed awfully strange, but I didn't think too much about it. Seeing the shadow made me wonder why the guy who was sold me the house kept looking over here. I put it away in my mind and rung the doorbell. Ding dong! It chimed. I suddenly heard a thud and footsteps come closer to the door. A woman opened the door. Oh, Gary! You've finally come! Do you have what we asked for, Dash? The woman said without looking up at me. When she did, she looked surprised. Huh? Who are you? She asked. I'm Jason. I just moved into the house next door. I was just coming by to say hi to my new neighbors, I said. The woman suddenly went pale for a second, before managing to control herself. Well, hello? I'm Mary. 
Sorry for being a bit rude with the huh? Heh. She chucked. No problem. If I saw a complete stranger at my door, I would probably react the same way. I responded. We talked for a bit, and I told her about my old apartment. Oh, that's terrible. I can't imagine living like that. Mary sympathized. Soon, the subject came to something that threw Mary off. Hey, I saw some shadow in your backyard. I said suddenly, Mary put on a weird, almost forced smile. Oh my, living in that apartment must be terrible. She repeated, though this time she shook her head sideways as if to say no. I also felt a chill creep up my spine. Mary tried to pull me back, but I broke out of her grip and looked behind the house. I saw the shadow from earlier. It inched closer. Mary tried to grab me, but it was too late. The shadow lunged at me, and I shouted. Ga! Ga! I shouted. I quickly sat up to find myself in a bed. I got up and realized I was in my new house. I looked at the time. It was 3 a.m. I felt pain circling around my chest. I touched it and felt some warm liquid. I looked at my chest to see dripping crimson. Blood, I muttered. I felt insanely sluggish and sore. I stumbled to the closet to see if I had any bandages and painkillers. After covering the wound in my chest, I went through the closet to look for painkillers. I had none. I panicked because I was really sore. I decided to look up where the nearest pharmacy was. It was a few blocks away. I didn't feel good enough to drive, so I walked. I imagined that it would be an amazing sight to see, a zombie-like man stumbling through an average suburban neighborhood at three in the morning, dripping blood from his chest. When I arrived at the pharmacy one of the cashiers screamed. Whoa! Holy! She trailed off as she fainted. The other cashier came out of the break room looking mildly surprised. He glanced at me and asked if I needed any painkillers. Yes. Please. I said. I figured. You know, we've seen worse people come here. This is just the girl's first day. He told me. Eesh. That's rough. I said. He reached behind the counter and grabbed a bottle. That's when I realized I hadn't even brought my wallet. I cursed under my breath as I told him I didn't have anything to pay with. Don't worry, it's on the house. I think you may need them more than this store needs five bucks. He responded. Thanks. I said gratefully. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna lift my friend over here onto the cot we have in the break room. He said. I arrived back home and swallowed a pill, putting the rest of the bottle in my closet. I then went to bed and waited until the next night to investigate what really happened. See, I knew that everything hadn't been just a dream. You can't get heavy wounds in your sleep. I knew that the shadow that had attacked me was what had caused me to get the wounds. What I didn't get was why I wasn't instantly killed by the attack. It confused me because something like that would end me instantly. Once the next night rolled around, I snuck out and crouched in front of Mary's house. There was light on, and I was pretty sure I saw figures inside, so I opened the window slightly and hid under it. They couldn't see me, but I could hear them. I heard footsteps walk into the room, as well as something scurry into the room. I figured Mary was the footsteps and the small footsteps were the alien being that had almost killed me. Mary shut the blinds and turned off the lights before she talked. Why would you do that? He wasn't hostile yet. Mary hissed. Be quiet, pawn. You shall question what I do. The alien said. It had a raspy, deep voice. Something you would wish you never heard after hearing it. It sent chills down my throat. Yes. I do. As long as I am caring for you and providing protection for you, 
I have a say in things too. Mary argued. Shut up. My kind does not need anything from you. The alien said clearly agitated. Well, you didn't have to kill him. Do you know how much energy it takes out of me to resurrect the dead? I couldn't move for a day. Mary said. Resurrect? The gears clicked in my head. I had died. But I had been brought back from the dead. By Mary? Suddenly, the alien grunted. Be quiet, pawn. I sense a presence. Both of them went silent. I can't let them find out about our powers and the plan. The alien said. Mary seemed to start backing away in a panic. Curiosity got the better of me, and I looked up, and what I saw. Mary was backing away towards the door and with a terrified look on her face. The alien was approaching her, and its tail suddenly sprouted a spear-like edge. No, no, no. You don't have to do this dash. Her sentence came to an abrupt end when the alien speared her in the chest. Holy dash. I clenched my hands to my mouth. The alien dropped her, and she started bleeding. Even more terrifying, Mary started disintegrating into dust. Soon all that remained of her was just blood, dust, and her clothes. The alien's head then did a 180 and turned to face me. I was so terrified I started sprinting back to my house as fast as I could. In hopes to reassure me, I told myself it was just a dream. Just a dream, just a dream, just a dash, G-L-A-R-G-H, dream. I ran into my house and shut the door, barricading it with my kitchen cabinet and my bookshelf. It was enough to keep the alien at bay. After a little bit of hear various bangs and trying to keep the just a dream mindset even though deep down i knew it wasn't the alien realized he would be caught and fled i'm still haunted by this memory to this day and i still see hints that it's watching me like various claw marks footprints and stains across my house please watch out the end Madness Manners. We developed the game with the aid of the I Ching. When I drew Hexagram 29 during the final stage of completion, I didn't take it seriously. Just another thing we did to make our work fun, like dressing up in medieval costumes and having play sword fights. I mean, we made Eldritch Dungeon last year with a freaking Ouija board. Little did I know that my flooding ravine prediction was about to come true. Madness Manners was a console game set in an old gothic house. You play a cute little chick who runs around in a pinafore chasing after ghosts, Ghostbusters style, except you trap them with a futuristic camera. Along the way you've got to help a bounty hunter kill a space vampire, there's a head in a glass box, whose body body is outside killing people, you marry a wolf man cursed by a gypsy with a missing hand, help little hairy alien monsters get on Shark Tank. Let's just say there's a lot going on. The renderings look so realistic you'd swear we'd taken photographs. Drawing room with antique furniture and immense fireplace. Gold framed picture of blonde witch Magda Chandler in her bald gown. Blue eyes that followed you around the room. A seance room. Bedrooms with detailed tapestries and overstuffed quilt adorned four posters. Old candelabras, of course, could be found everywhere. Anyway... It was midnight when I got done coding the finishing touches. In the morning there would be final beta tests, and someone would take over packaging and distribution. But at present, no one but me in this dark, candle-lit computer room, surrounded by suitably spooky decorations, and of course, the I Ching. I was even dressed for the occasion, old-timey suit just like the one my space vamp wears, sans greatcoat because it was too warm. About two in the morning, I felt an icy chill run down my back. 
A cold breeze whipped through the room, puffing out the candles and scattering my iching sticks all over the floor, hexagram 29 again on top. Funny thing is, the room had zero ventilation. One time our art guy, Joe Tobias, burned a bag of popcorn in the microwave and the smell wouldn't leave for a week, even with a fan and the door propped open. The second item that made me want to shit myself, my computer had apparently died, but the power light kept flickering in a Morse code pattern identical to the ghost lights I had programmed into the game. I didn't need a decoder card to translate, welcome to hell. And then, on the darkened screen, I saw Magda in the velvet curtain seance room, giving me a nasty look as she uttered incantations over a voodoo doll that looked like me. I noticed now, in the dim light radiating from the monitor, that the fallen I Ching sticks were moving, circling my chair, plowing through Dorito's crumbs, bumping aside a discarded pizza box. The sticks rose into the air, increasing speed, whirling around me. I saw the faces of my digital ghosts. I knew we shouldn't have played with that Ouija board on our last game. At some point, my heart stopped, and I felt myself drifting, out of my body, an otherworldly force sucking me, vacuum cleaner-like into the screen. The woman let out a mad barking laugh, and I heard the sounds of that creepy music box that always plays in the background of the game's ghost battles. I can guess what you're thinking, but I did not wake up on my computer lab's dirty soda-stained carpet. Instead, I found myself laid out on the lawn of a sprawling New England Victorian, and I had breasts. I touched them to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. Soft. Springy. Definitely not Joe Tobias's man boobs. I looked down and pieces started fitting together. I wore a pinafore. The mansion. And in the distance, the old house, the nearby tree lean probably leading to the oceanside cliff where Angelica Chandler took her swan dive to the rocks below. Joe really enjoyed rendering that scene where she got her eyes picked out by seagulls. Oh my god! I groaned. I'm Vicky Summers. I covered my mouth in horror. Even my voice had changed, gaining that annoying chipmunk sound provided by our so-called actress Roberta Wilson, soon to be Roberta Tobias. Guess that's what I get for cutting back on the energy drinks. I knew I hadn't fallen asleep, though because I was cold and wet. Could it be a sunny day? Oh no. In true gothic style, it always had to be monsoon season outside, lightning crashing every minute, tree branches so violent they should have broken all the dormer and casement windows, but I'd programmed it so even a bomb couldn't get you inside unless you solved all the puzzles. My predicament would be a, no pun intended, wet dream for some people, but as a developer, you only see coding mistakes, parts that don't work because you rush to meet a deadline. I guess I should have been thankful I didn't land in a game where things are trying to kill you every second, and I knew how to solve all the puzzles. Well I thought I did. Step 1, march past Angel Fountain on Circle Drive and steal package containing parts for Julia Whitaker's spirit camera, and associated uncancelled stamps. A shipping container did lay on the white front steps past the inoperative fountain, as expected. The big solid oak doors were shut, but I saw nobody peering through the mullioned windows, so the coast was clear. I never really thought about where Vicky put the things she picked up, but it turned out I had a large purse. The package would fit, not so sure about the shovel I'd have to use later to dig up Mephibosheth's vacant coffin. The interior of the purse did not extend to infinity like a cartoon. I hit a liner at the 15-inch mark. Feeling confident that I had it all figured out, I got a little cocky, using Roberta's voice to say all kinds of dirty things. Oh, Joe! Your huge fat belly is like a firm warm water bed. I just want to bounce on it while... I had to stop myself because my new female body actually got turned on by all that. Homie, you need to spend less time in front of the computer. Step 2, fish front door key out of planter next to door. I knelt down, examined the dirt, but came up with nothing. 
Even when I dug around with my fingers and turned the pot upside down, I only uncovered a root system and bugs. I dumped out the matching one in the opposite side. Still nothing. And then reality took another rotisserie-like spin as those massive doors with the decorative square panels swung open unexpectedly. A bony, bird-faced woman with horn-rimmed glasses and a tight old-style nurse's outfit marched out, jangling a set of keys. Looking for this? I shivered. The damn video game appeared to be reading my mind. My German Shepherd got loose, and he knocked over your plants. I'm really sorry, Ms. Whitaker. Her eyes narrowed. Did he also stick my mail in your purse? And then a hard predatory look appeared on her face. How do you know my name? It's I saw it on the package. I tried to stand up, but the second I made the attempt, she stabbed me with a needle, and everything got all swimmy, my arms and legs refusing to function. My hazy vision registered the Chandler's extravagant front foyer, spiral staircase, stained glass windows on the second floor landing. Whitaker muttered something to a greatcoat-wearing figure, then moved a gargoyle, opening a hidden door beneath the stairs. I got dragged past the furnace, circuit breakers, the regulator for the secret nuclear power plant. Then she threw me into a shadowy brick dungeon. It's too bad you're a girl she said with a laugh. We would have had some real fun. With that, she slammed the steel door, locking me in the dark with rats and a human skeleton. Not supposed to happen. Not how I programmed it. There was a loose brick ten feet from the door which could have potentially popped the lock, but I needed my hairy boyfriend to hold the brick down while I made my escape. In other words, I was screwed. Tobias, Roberta, Steve, Mr. Nishikado, whoever's at the computer right now, please don't touch the power. Do not restart it. Leave everything the way you saw it. I'm still in here. I'm going to get out, somehow. Please, by everything that is holy, do not touch the power. <laughs>